Today we're looking at Cool Borders 2 on the original PlayStation. I never played it back in the day, so I'm taking a fresh look at it and deciding if it's worth playing today. Welcome to Rad Rat Video. On this channel, I cover all kinds of skateboarding topics, but over the winter, I've been reviewing some snowboarding games. Some people suggested I try out Cool Borders 2, so I thought I'd give it a try. I know some of the later games around the PS2 era weren't very well received, but a lot of people seem to like this one. It came out way back in 1997, predating any skateboarding game on the system. So it's a pretty early 3D game, and one of the first 3D games with tricks in it. Is there any way this is still playable today? Surprisingly, it is. The first thing you'll notice is the graphics. They aren't great. But for people like me who grew up with 2D games and remember this jump to 3D being a huge impressive thing, they have a bit of charm. Sure, there are gaps between polygons sometimes and the animation isn't always spot on, but you can easily tell what everything is and it never really causes any problems. The trees are really good for the time. In a lot of games back then, they would just be one flat plane that always faces the camera. Here they look a little bit better, which is good because you'll be seeing them up close and personal a lot of the time. I also really like the texture work here, especially in this level with the cottages. It might not be impressive, but it's pleasant enough to look at. The graphic design in the menus is really rough though, but it takes me back to the 90s and it fits, so I guess that's okay. And let's talk about the controls. They're pretty simple, but they might take a little bit of getting used to these days since they're so out of date. You steer with the D-pad, and you can hit square to carve and turn a little sharper, but that slows you down. You can hold up to unweight and ride over bumpy terrain a little smoother. There aren't a lot of times you'll need to use that. Holding down makes you crouch, which is the best way to gain speed. Usually you might think that holding down will make you slow down or stop, but that's not how it works here. You jump with X, hold it down and release it to jump. You can wind up when you crouch too and you lose steering while crouched. It's a little weird though. In modern games like Infinite Air, you only wind up a little bit, a second at most. But with cool borders, you can basically wind up indefinitely and spin more the longer you hold it. In a race, if you see a jump coming up, you might be lucky to pull off a 360. But in these big air events, you can wind up pretty much from the gate and spin like a pinwheel. There are spins, flips, and off-axis stuff. It calls all of those misty flips. The problem with these is that you can't really stop yourself when you're done flipping, so you have to wind up the right amount. Every attempt counts, so it's pretty dangerous. I'll talk more about this in a bit. You can do grabs with different shoulder buttons and directions. It's kind of hard to memorize all of these because there isn't much of a system here. It seems like the controls are kind of random. You'll do a lot of straight airs on accident because you tried a button combination that does nothing. So I just memorized a couple of tricks and did them over and over like tail grabs, which are down down R2. You'll see these hint screens when the game is loading, so it's always trying to help you out, but it just feels like they could have done this better. The game penalizes you for repeating tricks, but that only really matters on the halfpipe. The triangle button will switch to first person, which is pretty much useless, but it's kind of fun to do it during big air. Speaking of big air, let's talk about the events. There's free ride, which is just race practice mode, then competition, halfpipe, and big air. Let's start with big air. It's just one jump, and you're scored on all these different categories like speed, distance, grab, and fakie. Pro tip, doing tricks fakey is pretty much free points. So on every run, just hit L1 or R1 right away to switch around. You'll go a little slower, so you'll score lower in a couple categories, but you can't get fakey points in regular stance, so there's really no downside to doing it every time. The only other issue is figuring out how to land straight. Right after you switch around, you can start winding up, but you are scored on your landing, so you have to be careful. Unlike pretty much every other game, there isn't much you can do to affect your landing once you're in the air. The only advice I can give you is to pick a landmark and start winding up at that spot every time. Maybe right when the plane of the ground jumps to the next angle or something like that. The different locations will all need their own spot to do that, but it's worth playing this mode for a while to get it down, and you'll see why in a minute. The spins are thankfully pretty forgiving of landing at an angle, but the flips not so much. So I tended to avoid them most of the time. On certain jumps, it was too easy to overflip, and if you don't wind up as much, it ends up being a less impressive trick. If you want practice, you can also try out the Trick Master mode, which is a good idea that doesn't seem to work. You get this endless lineup of jumps, and it tells you a trick to do. 
Eventually, it stops telling you the control unless you bail a trick. It's trying to get you to memorize all these tricks, but the thing is, I did this indie nosebone over and over and it just never counted it. The trick looks right and I'm hitting the buttons it asked me to, I just couldn't get any further than this. So that's too bad. The next event is the half pipe. Because of the really long wind up times, the flat bottom in this ramp is gigantic. It looks a little weird, but it plays all right. The one annoying thing is that you'll sometimes hang up on the coping, but you have no control over how you ollie, so it's tough to plan around. The half pipe mode isn't a ton of fun, and I didn't play it very much. Landing tricks is hard enough on the big air ramp even with practice, but getting the timing right on spins and flips is harder in the half pipe because your speed will change from wall to wall. A lot of times it feels like a dice roll whether you land it or not. It's basically just a bonus mode anyway because you never ride a half pipe in the competition mode. It's interesting though, reviews from this time raved over how amazing and fun the half pipe mode was. It was a fun and interesting new idea at the time. It's crazy to think that this became instantly outdated when the Tony Hawk series came out a couple years later. Okay, let's finally talk about the main mode of the game. So this is the competition mode. You alternate between big air events and races, going through nine rounds and accumulating points. If you fall too low in the rankings, you'll get a game over screen. When I first started playing this game, I just kept screwing it up, and I saw that game over screen a lot. I figured I could jump right in and figure it out, but I couldn't beat a single event. After two or three rounds, I'd just get a game over. I read through the manual, I did some practice rounds, but I never really got the hang of it. I had to read some strategy guides online, and I realized the character I picked, Jin, was only for expert players. I switched to a character more friendly to beginners, and I started having a little more success. Another thing I had to learn was the different board styles. This is pretty interesting actually. There are freestyle boards, all around boards, and alpine boards. The freestyle boards will help with tricks, but they aren't as fast or good at carving. The alpine boards are faster, but they're really slow in riding fakey, they're bad at turns, and they aren't good for tricks either. So if you're having trouble with one type of event, you can always give yourself a little boost by picking one or the other. And each category has a few variations as well, so you can fine tune your preferences more. There's really no good reason to pick an alpine board, because the big air event is really important. You have two rounds that you have to complete, and your totals are added up. It doesn't throw out your low score, so there's no room for error. When you finish, your starting position in the race is determined based on your ranking in big air. But this isn't like a pole position in a car race, where you're only a few car lanes further back. It puts you on a timer, and you start really late if you score badly. If you bail a trick and then start in last place, you'll be 20 seconds behind first place, and it's basically impossible to come back from that. So with that in mind, it makes a lot more sense to use a trick board and place well in the starting position. Even if you're slow and you lose a place or two, it's a lot better than starting last and racing really well and gaining only a few spots. Let's talk about the actual races. You steer around some obstacles and there are five jumps in each stage. You can do tricks here and it keeps track of them, but it's basically just a high score thing. It's not like you get a boost or anything like that. In general, I would just do a straight grab. It's kind of risky to do a spin trick because you might end up landing sideways. Sometimes you try to turn around and it just doesn't want to make you start riding fakey. You have to just kind of wiggle your way into position and start racing again. You can lose a lot of time here if you don't do it right. Aside from the ramps, there are different paths and even a few rails to grind. There's a bit of depth to these levels. You can spend time figuring out the ideal path, but it's not like this is Gran Turismo here. You don't need to spend weeks getting your racing line right or anything. There's some good variety to the style of the levels, but there are some crappy ones in there too, like this one. It almost seems like they went out of their way to make it annoying. There are a ton of trees peppered throughout the mountain, and it's really easy to get caught in and bounce around the forest like a pinball. It's stressful, but not in a fun way. It feels like you just get lucky if you happen to get through it cleanly. And you have to. The computer racers crash every now and then, but if you want a chance at winning the race, you just have to memorize where they all are and figure out a path. But don't use the same path as someone else, you'll just get knocked into a tree and get stuck bouncing back and forth. But that's not the worst part. There's this completely stupidly hard curve right here. It's a really narrow ledge and it's a tight turn. You can slow down a bit when you carve, but you can't actually slow down and take the turn carefully. You pretty much have no choice but to just blast through at full speed ahead and probably fall off the side a dozen times. It resets you pretty quickly, and luckily all of the other racers will plummet to their death a few times too. That's just bad design. 
If you can't get through it cleanly and it doesn't really matter, then why bother making it so hard? Luckily, most of them aren't bad and you have a lot of fun racing through them. There are frustrating moments like these logs you have to jump over, but it's just one tough part and then you're back to a normal race. So you finish your race, then you go back to big air over and over and you rack up points throughout these events. When you beat all nine rounds, you'll unlock mirror mode where you can play the flipped levels. It's a good bonus to help keep the game fresh later. It's nice that they give you something because this mode is really hard. You pretty much have to do everything perfectly first try. If you mess up a big error, then you'll start late in the next race, and next thing you know you've got a game over and you have to start over from the first event. It's a lot like a classic arcade game, but you can't feed it more quarters to keep going. This is the kind of game that I would have loved back in the day. There's no need to save your progress, even though you can. You can just pop the game in whenever you want and do a few runs. Your stats don't get better as you beat levels or anything like that, so it's the ultimate pick up and play snowboarding game, at least 20 years ago in 97. By today's standards, this is a little weird and almost makes it seem pointless. Why bother going through all the work if I can just play all the levels from the beginning in free ride mode? But at the time, this was pretty common, and it makes sense if you can get back into that 90s mindset. You're not trying to progress in the game, you're just trying to kill some time before your parents kick you off of the family TV so they can watch Frasier. Something else you can do when you're done with the game is design your own board. It's a cool option, but it's basically impossible to do anything good. I made a rad rat deck and then rode it around a bit. It looks terrible from a distance, and drawing pixel by pixel with a dozen colors really doesn't open you up to a lot of great options, but it is there. So is this game worth playing today? Honestly, there's nothing here that isn't done better somewhere else, like in Infinite Air. The physics are more accurate, the animation is better, there's a lot more depth to the gameplay. But to me, there's just the nostalgia factor of games from this time. You have those charming, chunky graphics. Uh, the controls and the simplicity, they just give it a feel that you can't really get anywhere else now. There aren't 12 kinds of experience points you're trying to get while you're unlocking trophies, and you don't have to buy any new levels as DLC. You get the whole game you paid for, and you can enjoy it however you want. And it's challenging enough to keep you coming back. Plus, it's only a couple bucks for an original copy, or six bucks if you want to download it as a PS1 Classic on PlayStation Network. It's good enough to kill a day or two of free time at least. So, what do you think of Cool Borders 2, and how about the rest of the series? I think I played a few of them really briefly back in the day, but I don't have a lot of experience with the series as a whole, so which one should I do next? Let me know in the comments. Until next time, here are some more videos that you might like, and subscribe so you don't miss out on anything. I have two new skateboard game reviews going up next week um, on Tuesday, Tony Hawk 4, and stay tuned for Thursday. I got something special for you. Uh, thank you for watching.